Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and great pleasure to be here in front of all of you, quite a daunting audience. Um, as I thought about universities and society, I was reminded of something that happened to me a long, long time ago when I actually had my first field job. I studied tropical agronomy and one of my first jobs was in a place called Papua New Guinea, which is very far and many of you may not ever have been there. Papua New Guinea was then actually um, literally coming out of the Stone Age. And one day, with my interest in vegetation and plants and so on, I walked in the forest with a group of women. And um, I was asking about the flowers and the plants, and I said, what is this? Well, it's a flower, they answered to me. And then I pointed out another one, and they said, well, yes, that's also a flower. Um, <laughs> which sort of brought home to me that the kinds of distinctions we make may not always be the distinctions other people make. But then they, were, they became curious about me. And they said, actually, why do you want to know? So I gave them this whole spiel about being at the university and doing research and so on. And I saw this, this you know, uh, idea in their eyes of what does it mean, university? What is a university? So I said, it's about education. It's about developing um, knowledge and so on. And they said to me, the best education for a woman is to have a child. Um, Yes, yes, I said, yes, uh, okay, yes, but you know, there's also something knowledge, understanding. It was the end of the conversation. <laughs> so when I thought about how can universities matter, and do they matter, and what do we tell society, and not those of us who are here, or uh, those who have studied, but how do we tell society about the importance of universities in the age of internet? What should we tell them? How can we explain? that we need funds to continue education, that we need funds from all kinds of sources, and that it's justified to give it to these funds. We need the story. <coughs> and actually, it's always good to take back um, a, a kind of time perspective and ask ourselves, what did it look like uh, some time ago, and, and where are we going? When I studied, um, <coughs> I went to university in the 1970s, um, universities just came out of perhaps the golden age of the ivory tower. I went to university at a time when we as students felt that the university was becoming obsolete, that universities had to be in the world. And in fact, we knew very little about that world. We believed, for example, that great steps forward were being taken in China. We knew nothing about the human cost of the Chinese revolution. We thought that the nuclear winter was the future and not global warming. We had no idea about a lot of things. But one thing we did know about, and that was that society required and that would ask for relevant institutions, relevant universities, relevant knowledge. So that was the, the big story of the time when I was a student. The ivory tower had to be abolished and universities had to become relevant. And this relevant was very literal. It, it had to be immediately relevant. Today, now, we were going, in my fields in agronomy, we were going to develop varieties of rice for poor people. We were going, not a truly really complicated way of genetics and so on, it had to be relevant immediately. So my social science colleagues, for example, believed that they had to study something about social structures or constructs or whatever they called them, um, and that it was Totally irrelevant to study the history of the Ottoman Empire, for example. You had to study current day Yugoslavia, for example. Titans, <coughs> constructs, not the past, not even the future. Relevant <coughs> meant being in society today. Now, of course, that was very much also a fallacy the fallacy of immediate relevance. But it was a nice story to sell universities with. It is, of course, a fallacy because there is not such a thing that relates relevance, knowledge, impact in an immediate way. First of all, it denies the existence of serendipity. A lot of things are developed just by chance. Of course, you know all the story of about, about penicillin, for example, as a chance discovery of some kind of a mold in a petri dish. More interesting, more um, current day story is, of course, the development of Viagra, 
don't need to explain what Viagra is to you, but <laughs> Viagra started off as a rather um, useless sort of medicine for cardiac uh, situations, say people with um, arrhythmia and so on. Turned out to have some side effects, and those side effects uh, were actually a lot more relevant. But it was relevant in a roundabout way. Nobody set out to develop a Viagra type of medicine. So immediate relevance, of course, as we demanded it in the 1970s, was a fallacy. But yet the appeal of doing something concrete, something useful, of course, is, is there. In my own university, I'm, I'm really pleased and proud, and I'm absolutely sure that the scientists we work with feel the same way, that we can actually develop things that matter, that mean something. Now, you could argue in our field it's easy. Uh, we work on mosquitoes, mosquitoes transfer malaria, so doing something about mosquitoes is, is a story you can explain to everybody. But what about land tenure in the 12th century or you know, the birth of black holes in the universe? How can we explain that? How can we explain that we need so much money to develop a, or even not develop, but to search for an elusive Higgs boson or something else in CERN. Can we, can we really justify uh, to society all that money at a time when there's more and more pressure on all kinds of other needs that society also has? In a society where more people become old, um, where we don't have the, the social structures that we had before. How can we say we need more money for research, more money for education, more money for universities when our hospitals are suffering? That's not an easy story to tell. And I think it's very important today that we really construct again a story that explains why universities are so relevant, why they have been relevant, why their half-lifetime, to quote Sir David last night, uh, is a lot longer than the half-lifetime of a lot of um, big companies. But we still need to tell that story. Now, when I take the story from the 1970s, from this idea of immediate relevance, and I carry it through, you'll see in the 1980s that some of that calmed down. But what happened is that universities became more and more tied up with governments. They had to be immediately relevant, but especially for government policy, and especially for things that were immediately useful to the labor market. And that trend actually uh, continues until today. It has its impact on the way we look at education. It has its impact on the way we look at skills development. If you look at the, the European programs, for example, Horizon 2020 or the previous one, framework programs, uh, you'll see that the main justification for Europe to um, allocate that much money, and you know, framework program seven um, covers about 55 million, sorry, 55 billion euros, billion euros, that's an enormous amount of money. Um, the justification is it helps with competitiveness and it helps with job creation, and it helps to grow GDPs. So in fact, the, the whole way we now look at research is a way that actually narrows down research, education and universities in, in a little box. And that is still the box of usefulness. There is, however, an other trend going on, but it's a trend that is sometimes elusive, sometimes very elitist, and that's the trend towards, um, is still called with a German term, Bildung. Building, meaning uh, in, in this context, uh, the development of self, the development of personalities. It was a term coined by the uh, German scientist uh, writer uh, von Humboldt, who created also um, the first um, university in Berlin. And von Humboldt said, education is absolutely necessary because it helps us to uh, become true human beings. <coughs> And interestingly enough, as a counterbalance to that whole story about usefulness, there is now a trend to say, okay, no, it has to be about building. And if you look at the American Ivy League um, institutions, for example, you see there's a lot of emphasis on um, creating balanced human beings or developing all the skills or whatever way they want to uh, call it. 
However, a lot of that building is in fact uh, also a, a kind of trap towards excellence, towards individual development. And I think while there is a, a strong emphasis on the individual today, there is also the idea of community. And building is not a matter of communities. It is something that really is about you and you only. And however important it is, we can probably not guarantee the building through universities for everybody. And that raises a number of interesting questions about where we go with universities, what, what we want and how, how do we tell society that we do need all that money, that we really want money not only to do research but also to do education. There's another development. So when I go from the 70s, so the, you know, the ivory tower is crumbling. It all has to be about immediate relevance. And slowly immediate relevance is commuted or changed into policy relevance, relevance in an economic sense. And that has continued until today. Only the language we use for that is different. We now ask universities to be relevant because they need to nurture their spin-offs and startups and all kinds of economic activities that come forward through bright ideas of students and staff and um, uh, you know all kinds of practical things. So for example, yesterday at 9 a.m., mind the time, I inaugurated the very first um, vending machine for fresh, hotly baked um, French fries. Just think about it. Uh, it's, it's on Twitter, so you can, you can see it. It's, it's actually a nice piece of serious technology because it's very complicated to have frozen French fries, bake them immediately in, in a piping hot oil and not have any smell. But it's the kind of spin-off that everybody is very happy about. So uh, wonderful promises about having French fry vending machines all over the world. Marvelous. I mean, as a university president, I couldn't be more happy that there are all kinds of ideas. And on top of it, uh, we have all these uh, patents on how to pipe or hot oil and clean it with filters and not have any um, uh, sort of waste unnecessarily. But of course, however interesting, universities are not about that only. We know that. We feel that. So the trend from immediate usefulness to policy relevance to economic usefulness continues until today. And nearly every evaluation or calculation of research looks at these spin-offs and it's the right thing to do and it's important. But you know and I know that it's very difficult to get an immediate link between um, job creation, for example, or economic competitiveness and university education or university training. And this must be a warning to us all. Let us not fall into the trap of selling universities for their economic use only. However important, certainly in a period of crisis, certainly at this very point in time, after the real dissolutions that we've had with economic growth being just the thing that would continue and continue, the temptation of selling universities for the wrong reason is a serious one. So we have that trend towards economic development and economic utility. But something else happened, and it happened from the 1990s onwards. And that is what I would call selective shopping. Selective shopping meaning that as governments and all kinds of interest groups wanted information, they started to shop and use universities uh, more and more as a kind of supermarket where you could pick out the gems that you needed, whether it was on global warming, on genetic modification, on you know traffic densities, what have you, health issues. Just pick and choose, you take your cherries and construct your case. It's the university being used as a kind of supermarket for the kinds of arguments that we often have, of course, and should have in complex societies like our own. It is, in a way, a justification. Of course, we, there should be a place in society where all kinds of ideas can be developed. And where, of course, it is in the nature of our educational system that there is rarely just one blueprint or just one view of what knowledge is about. 
but it's dangerous to get this kind of inflation of ideas where just any idea is of the same value and for the public at large, the, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Okay, there's a group of people who don't believe in climate change, mind the wording, believe, and there's a group of people who believe it's imminent, highly dangerous and around the corner and we have to do something. Well, say the media, the truth must be somewhere in the middle. And that is a dangerous development. Yes, it is important to be able to gather the arguments, to be able to gather the information, the data, the knowledge that we have. But we must also show that our supermarket of knowledge, our university supermarket, has a lot of empty spaces, empty shelves. There are all kinds of things we don't know about. There are all kinds of things we're not sure of. Because science and research and knowledge development, as it is reflected in the training for our students, always needs to be a, an evolutionary process. There is very rarely a final end to what we know. Yes, we have a couple of laws of, of thermodynamics and I don't think they will change. But for most of the knowledge, there is an issue of interpretation. There is an issue of this is the state of the art today. The interesting uh, experience I had in this respect myself, I used to teach for a long time a, an interdisciplinary course in Spain about uh, southern Spain, about soils and um, geomorphology, plants, uh, irrigation, water, what have you, erosion. And we did that with various professors. And the, for those of you who are not soil scientists, it's a wonderful course, it's a wonderful subject, because the thing you get to do is be out in the hills all the time, dig holes, or rather use your students to dig the holes. <laughs> and then you look at the profile and you say, hmm, now you see this little red band, oh, it must be Andy soils or something like that, whatever. No, no, Andy soils there, but it doesn't matter. But this is obviously a matter of interpretation. We can do a little bit better now because we have more sophisticated equipment, but there's still always a matter of interpretation. We as professors used to really love quarreling about you know, this little brown band and look at this little pebble there and isn't it a proof of <laughs> continental drift, what have you. Our students were aghast. They hated us. Why can't you tell us how it is? There, it's this or it's that. I mean, give us a choice. Don't, don't leave us in uncertainty. But this is exactly the point. There are a lot of things that are still in the realm of interpretation and get reinterpreted and reviewed as we go on. That's very much the nature of education. So as we move through the 1990s to today, this issue of selective shopping in our universities has become quite a serious one, and it will remain so. Underlying that is a development that's even more serious. And it, there are very few things that keep me awake, certainly not my university. But what does keep me awake is the erosion of trust in science and education. And that's a very serious one, and it's a particularly serious one for Europe, I feel. Europe, through all kinds of reasons, including perhaps a certain degree of inward looking through the crisis that has hit us differently maybe, through maybe um, a sense of, of more pessimism than other parts of the world. Europe is seriously concerned about the role and the credibility of science. You see that very much played out in discussions about shale gas, uh, about uh, nanotechnology, of course, ge genetic modification, uh, and so on and so forth. Also in the area of health, nutrition. There is a feeling that science is no more than just an opinion. Indeed, this idea of the truth is somewhere in the middle. But even worse, in the area of internet, of course, you can find any single opinion somewhere on the internet. And it looks as if it's all the same. It's starting to look as if science is just another set of opinions. And that is a fundamental challenge to us all because universities matter in society because they are more than just a set of opinions. They're more than just individual ideas. They are about the real serious trying and retrying of verification. And of course we make mistakes, of course we have to review things, and of course scientists and, and students are only humans. 
but there is no other system of what I would call organized and systematic doubt outside of universities. That is our great contribution to society. That we try and retry and see and reevaluate and review what we know. That we formulate hypotheses and that we have them falsified. That is such an essential step forward from even 200 years ago, even maybe less in some parts of the world. The fact that it's all about fate or belief or gods who decide what happens and that everything has a, a sort of supernatural cause. We know why things happen in many cases, just not always. And we learn as we go on. But that fundamental organized doubt is a major contribution that we have to society. And exactly that process is being put into question, is being eroded by the fact that society feels that scientists are also perhaps uh, privileged or biased or have something at stake or uh, work too much with the industry or too little with NGOs. In any case, they cannot be objective. I get letters about every week telling me that science is not an objective endeavor. And of course it's not, but it's the best we have. It's like democracy. It's a bad system but we have no better system. And that's in a way, you know, bad in, 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 in uh, inverted commas. That's true with science as well. It's not perfect, definitely not. But there's no greater contribution that we have than that we teach students to think in that way. And this is an important corollary of what I'm trying to, to share with you. That is, as we move from immediate utility, economic utility towards this issue of, of doubt, of supermarket shopping, it has had a major impact on our education, on what we expect from students. In the ivory tower period, it was the professor who decided that you needed to learn the second law of thermodynamics and a few other things. And then, if you knew that, that was it. Perfect. Then we had to teach or we had to learn all kinds of things about how to be socially relevant. That's where uh, a lot of the studies on minorities, on gender and so on, came, came about. And it's a good thing they did. And it's, it's very important that we take out the bias from our education. But of course, there are skills that are essential, but not enough. So as we went over time in the last few decades, we have been emphasizing very much the skills. So you have to know something about business, you have to know something that is practical, you have to uh, be able to write a project proposal, you have to be able to write a grant proposal, you have to be able to interpret or learn or, or read a government report. All that is very good, but it's still a long way from building, from building. and we have, we have to find a balance there between the development of skills and the kinds of useful things that people need. And so here we are now, in 2015, with universities, yes, they matter, but how will they continue to matter? And what, what is necessary to develop them for a society that will per perhaps be even more torn apart with all kinds of opinions, where selective shopping of knowledge will become even more important? It's, a, it's an interesting and important question. I don't have all the answers, but I can share a few things with you. First of all, of course, universities are still very much in demand. I cannot think of anybody who wouldn't want his or her daughter or son to go to university, who doesn't feel that education is the road, maybe not to happiness, maybe not to prosperity, but the road to something better, something that lifts you out of your generation, out of the... Uh, the, 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 the way you have been set in, in the world. You could even say the poorer a family is, the more they want their children to be educated. And I think that's an enormous good because it makes us different, very fundamentally different from any other human species. What we can do is not just learn by copying the, the older generation, by like even primates do or animals do, copying learning through experience. We learn through the accumulated knowledge of previous generations. That is fundamentally different. We can absorb, certainly now with the internet at our fingertips, we can absorb the knowledge 
from generations and generations, millennia of people who have been thinking before us. And isn't that a wonderful feeling? Yes, that is what education is about. It is not about just having this massive amount of information. There's a fundamental difference between knowledge, thinking, and information. And the risk we run, ladies and gentlemen, is that we emphasize too much information to the detriment of thinking and knowledge. Because what we need to learn, and the reason why universities are so fundamentally important, is that we, we teach students to see through that enormous mass of information. We teach them a methodology in whatever field to formulate hypotheses, to formulate ideas, to justify them, to validate them, to search for, for information, to not be biased and not be selective. The most important thing in university, perhaps, as a, a sort of meta message that we could give to our students is that everybody has a right to his own opinion, but nobody has a right to his or her own facts. Facts are holy. Opinions may evolve. And even facts may sometimes evolve. But to understand the difference between opinion and fact is a very important one. To understand that validation is part of how we have moved forward as a human society is extremely important. And that justifies, in my view, us telling society that money needs to be invested in our institutions. And it's not a matter of course anymore, because as I said to you, there's this tremendous pressure of selective shopping, of thinking that there is some, some average truth somewhere, or even asking whether universities are objective or even have a right to exist. So yes, you have the right to your own opinion, but you don't have the right to your own facts. And there's another corollary here, which I feel uh, we often forget as well, and that is the importance of language. I feel that what I have taught my students, perhaps more than anything else, more than you know, how to recognize the botany of cassava plants or bananas or what have you, far more than that, is the use of language. There's nothing you can understand if you don't understand language. There's nothing you can explain to somebody else if you don't know how to master language in writing and in speaking. And we do, at least let me limit that to continental Europe with the exception perhaps of France, we do too little in developing these language skills. And I'm not talking about orthography or grammar, I'm talking about language as a vehicle for thought. And the beloved Oliver Sacks, who just died, as you know, last weekend, who, uh, whose work I think we all greatly admire. In one of his books, I believe it's um, Seeing Words or something, um, said something about language, I think, which is really important. He said, language is not just another skill or some kind of a talent. It is really fundamental to thought. It's language through which we express our thoughts. And it's language that makes the difference between thinking and non-thinking, between being human and not being human. And that's exactly it. And if there's one contribution I think universities make and must continue to make, it's in the mastery of language. Because it's language that can help us to enter into a dialogue. Because that's the other story that I wanted to tell you. Yes, we have to be useful. Yes, we have to do something about building. But we also are part, increasingly so, of a community. Our ivory tower has gone. We are rooted in society. We are perhaps globally relevant. Our mandate, for example, at Wageningen is definitely a global mandate. But we are locally rooted. And interestingly enough, as globalization goes on, the justification for a university cannot just be in terms of economic contributions to a nation state. That's going to be less and less important. What is important is on the one hand a global contribution to knowledge, on the other hand the engagement in a dialogue. And a dialogue per definition is local or regional. We haven't always been very good at that, I must say because it's difficult to enter in a dialogue. A dialogue is not just something about 
um, I'll tell you the truth and I'm organizing a symposium for you tonight and just come and listen to my facts and then you will be convinced. Of course, that's not how it works. A dialogue means listening and listening to language and listening particularly to what is not being said or what is said in an oblique way. That's something we haven't trained ourselves at very well. But I believe firmly that we should teach our students, that we should focus even our education on this idea of language and dialogue, whatever the disciplinary field, whatever, you know, whether they are uh, in medical science or in law, it doesn't matter. We need to engage in a dialogue with society, perhaps more so today than before. More so because we are asked for a justification. More so because we're using public funds or we're using funds from other sources. But in any case, accountability is what counts. That's what's being asked. So where do we go from here? Can we just say, well, you know, Ivory Tower is over, we're being pretty relevant, uh, we're doing quite a few things, we're teaching our students, uh, we're doing all the right things. We are, of course, not, and you know probably better than I, our student population will seriously change over the next few years. They will become even more international. They may be people who, in a demographic sense, are going to be far more diverse. They may range from 17 to 70. They may come in not to do four years of education. They may come in only more briefly. They may go shopping from one university to the next, university hopping, even continental hopping, perhaps. Perhaps we should think of universities not as a place where you are from age 17 to 24 or less, but as a place which is there and hospitable to everybody of any age. It's there for people who work and for people who do not work. It's there for society as a place where you enter in a dialogue, where you can learn, where you can teach, where ideas are being nurtured, are being validated, ideas that are relevant to society. And that's quite a different way of thinking about universities. It's something we are only starting to grasp. But I think if we ask ourselves how can we matter, that is the way. Not a standard university, not a specialized university by definition, but a place where people can meet, where people can find ideas, develop the language and the skills to see through the information and find a way forward. So in the end, if you ask me how can universities matter and do they matter, in the end I think it boils down to two ideas. One is about research and knowledge and one is about education. About research and knowledge, let me say that I think we have been perhaps conceiving of research in university too much as a kind of production chain. You put in a pound or a dollar or a euro and a little box of useful knowledge comes out. What we need is to go back to the thinking process. It's the process itself that counts, not so much the outcome because of serendipity and all kinds of other reasons, maybe the end result is as important as the process itself. And that's what counts. So thinking, rather than research as a sort of activity where presidents become CEOs and professors become sort of group industry leaders, no, it's thinking. Thinking and language. And what we want to tell then is the story of how wonderful it has been that we collectively as humankind have been able to move ourselves forward in even only maybe a few hundred thousand or even less ten thousand years or even a thousand years. Just imagine what we have been able to do. And all of that has been able to come about because we were so much concentrated on bringing knowledge forward from one generation for, to the next, on validating our knowledge, on thinking. And today, more than ever before in history, that thinking itself, that access to thinking has been democratized. It poses a great challenge, but it's a wonderful idea to think that in principle, a university type of thinking is possible for everybody. And that great idea of our evolution as a thinking species, as a talking species, as a writing species, that is the, the bottom line story that I think we should tell as universities.
And in teaching, I think it's exactly the mirror image of that. We want to teach, whether it's four years or two years or one month, but we want our alumni that really have sort of put their feet into this process of thinking, who feel part of that enormous human chain of people who have been thinking, and who have been thinking not just about themselves, but about society, about change, about innovation. And isn't it wonderful to think that you are an alumni, alumnus of a university, and that you're part of something much bigger than yourself? That in itself is building. When I then think back of my, my ladies in Papua New Guinea who told me having a child is the only education for a woman, I can now answer to them. I can say, yes, perhaps having a child is the education, but my education is to understand also what having children means in society, how children learn, how childbirth comes about, anything from medical to social knowledge, how women are fed or whatever, I can give them a myriad of answers. My education is to understand all those layers behind it. I couldn't have explained that to them, but I'm happy that I can tell you today that our wonderful system of universities will continue to matter as we see these big messages, if we invest in a learning process, in a process of language, in a balance between utility and building, in the end, because without universities, there can be no future society. Thank you very much.